Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I just want to say a few thank yous before we start. Uh, first, to Debbie Katz for suggesting today's topic. The Meaningful Tefillah Project is always open to new suggestions, and please feel free to share yours for future programs. Second, I want to thank today's sponsors, Rabbi Roy Rosenbaum, in honor of two birthdays today, those of his wife, Judy, happy birthday, and their grandson, Gedalia Rosenbaum. And I want to thank our other sponsors, Max and Debbie Rudman. As you know, we usually use sponsor funds to supply refreshments at Meaningful Tefillah events, and while that is unfortunately not possible during the pandemic, we do look forward to in-person events at some point in the near future in Yerza Hashem and appreciate your sponsorships for making them possible. Finally, thank you to Rabbi Rosenbaum for enthusiastically agreeing to give today's shear. I now hand it over to you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stuart. And uh, big yashikoch to Stuart for continuing to organize this. I don't remember how many years Stuart has been organizing these programs for, but... Uh, Not either. <laughs> many. <laughs> you know, but... Uh, uh, it's, actually, yeah. It's really, it's really a, a very inspiring thing to always see him so engaged, always coming up with new ideas. And uh, thank you to Stuart and thank you to Debbie for making the suggestion. And if I could just put in a personal uh, happy birthday to my mother, I'd appreciate it. I do mm. remember um, 10 years ago today, I called my mother around six o'clock in the morning from, the, from Holy Cross Hospital. And I, I said two things. I said, first of all, I want to wish you a happy birthday. And my second question is, would you be willing to share it with a child? So that was how we <laughs> let my mother, my parents know that we had given birth to a tired, had a baby through the night. So Masel Tov, and, uh, thank you very much. Okay. Um, so... It's very interesting. The Rosh Hashanah Musaf, thank you everybody for joining today. The Rosh Hashanah Musaf is the longest Musaf Shmona Esrei of the entire year. Um, the construct of the Rosh Hashanah Musaf is unique. The standard structure of any Shmona Esrei, of every Shmona Esrei throughout the year, is the first three brachos that we're all very familiar with, the brachos about Mogen Avraham and basically the beginning of Shmon Esri through the time that we would do Kedusha and the Chassan's repetition. That's, we always have that. The end of Shmon Esri, the section starting with Ritzay through the end is the ending of Shmon Esri. We always have that. The first section is thought of as general praise of Hashem. The last section is thought of as general, uh, as general thanks to God for different things for with, it, with which he's provided us. And then we have the middle section. So on weekdays, the middle section are all kinds of requests. And on Shabbos and Yom Tiv, the middle section are not requests per se. The middle section is what we call Kedushas Hayom, the sanctity of the day. That's the standard Shabbos or Yom Tiv format for Shmona Esrei. And the standard Shabbos or Yom Tiv format for Musaf Shmona Esrei is the same three brachos at the beginning, the same three brachos at the end. And then this middle bracha, which would speak about the type of Korban Musaf, the type of Musaf offering that will be brought in the base of Mikdash on this day, and a special note about the day itself. And that, and that really is the middle bracha of Shmona Esrei. When it comes to Rosh Hashanah, we have a whole different construct of the middle component of Shmona Esrei, and that is this famous trio of Malchios, Zichronos, and Shofros. And each one of these sections gets their own bracha. Malchios, loosely translated, is that we recognize that God is our king. Zichronos, loosely translated, is that we recognize that God is the ultimate judge and he remembers all. And shofros is we speak of the unique capacity of the shofar. Each of these ideas is fundamentally connected to the ultimate symbol of the day, which is the shofar, right? Um, and because each of these ideas is connected to the shofar, that's why in the Chazan's repetition on Musaf, we blow shofar at the end of each of these sections. Um, a number of people have asked me this year if one is davening privately, should they blow shofar? The halach is one doesn't blow shofar during Shmon Esri when, when davening privately. One certainly makes a to to the, to the 30 basic shofar blows at the beginning of, uh, you know, at some point over Rosh Hashanah davening. But we don't blow, when davening privately, we don't blow uh, during Shmon Esri. But during the Chazan's repetition with the minion, we have shofar blowing during each of these three sections. And what I'd really like to spend time on today is going through each of these three sections. We won't go through literally word for word, but I'm going to share the screen with a mox in a second so we can each have an appreciation for it. But before we go there, I just want to share with you a very interesting quote from the Gemara in Rosh Hashanah. The Gemara in Rosh Hashanah says, 
imru lefonai malchios kedeshe tamlichuni olechem. Recite before me, this is God saying to the Jewish people, recite before me the section of Malchios, the section about my, my monarchy, so that you will coronate me over you. I think we can relate to that. If we talk about the fact that God is our king, presumably we relate more to his rule over us. I mean, that I think it logically makes a lot of sense. V'zichronos k'deishiyala zichronechem l'fanai l'tova share the section of God's being a judge, God remembering, so that I remember you positively, that I think is a little bit tougher. So if I talk about God as being a judge, now he'll judge me well. If I didn't talk about God as being a judge, I'm in serious trouble. But now that I talk about the fact that God is a judge, now I'm in good shape, I think we have a difficult time relating to that. And with what? With what will I look upon you positively by shofar with the shofar. So that phrase is, that quote is supposed to explain the flow of the Rosh Hashanah Mosef. Malchios, we're supposed to coronate God. Zichronos, if we talk about the fact that he's a judge, he'll judge us well, which is difficult to understand. And the way he'll judge us well is with shofar. Now we understand that he'll judge us well if we blow the shofar, that's the mitzvah of the day. But we also have to understand why is it so positive to talk about the shofar? Right? What do we say all the time? It's much better to do something than to talk about it. So why do we have to have a section of Shemar's way talking about the shofar? Let's just blow the shofar. Right? And I guess furthermore, particularly this year, one could pose the question, we talk about shofar in the Rosh Hashanah Musaf on the first day of Rosh Hashanah too. Guess what? First day of Rosh Hashanah Musaf, we're not even going to blow the shofar. It's Shabbos. We don't blow the shofar on Shabbos. So why are we even talking about it? We're just bringing attention to something we're not doing. So it, it, it's a little bit difficult to understand why it's so important to talk about the shofar and Rosh Hashanah, why it's so important to talk about God being a judge. And by the way, what does it mean to talk about God being your king? What does that mean anyway? So hopefully people are sufficiently confused so that we can proceed. Um, my goal is definitely not to be just speaking the whole time. Um, I'm very, very happy to hear people's thoughts. Um, I guess what I'll do is, is in between each section, I'll jump back to my chat. I think as I'm sharing the screen, I don't have access to the chat. So people can feel free to chat in questions or comments as we go. And at each section, I'll kind of stop and, and take a look at the chat. And then also at that point, I'll invite people who want to uh, share comments, uh, you know, unmute themselves and share comments. That would be great. Okay, so I, can you see can you see the screen in front of you? Can you see that? So this is compliments of Sfaria. Um, thank you, Debbie, for getting me on this in the first place. Um, this is uh, the text of the Rosh Hashanah Mosaf. I didn't share the first part of the Rosh Hashanah Mosaf because that's the part that's true for every Shmon Esra. So the first section is we speak about the fact that God chose us among all the other nations. This is actually standard fare for Yom Tov Davening. Then we thank God for giving us this day of remembrance, Rosh Hashanah. Then, oh, sorry about that. Then we say, because of our sins, okay, I guess I'm a little, because of our sins, God, you have exiled us from this land. That's this paragraph here. This is also standard fear for holidays. We say to God, we really wish we could bring the appropriate Musaf offering on this day as we do, as we would if there would be a temple. But unfortunately, there's not a temple. So God, all we could do is talk about the Musaf offering. And now we cite the verses of the Musaf offering of Rosh Hashanah. Now, up until this point, there's been nothing different from any other basic holiday format. And now all of a sudden, we have Olenu. And this obviously is a very, very significant departure from the normal Russia, uh, Yom Tov Musaf. I do want to clarify that we have Olenu because some people, when they see it in the Rosh Hashanah Musaf, might think that they missed something at the Davrik's almost over and get a little bit excited. So it's there to clarify. I want to clarify to you that that's not the case. And of course, as we know, if we only think about it, is Olenu is a remarkably powerful tefillah. And we say it so often, so many times, we say it, it's hard to think about what we even mean when we say Olenu. 
But Aleinu is a powerful tefillah, and an expression of its power is we include it in the Musaf on Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur as well. I just want to go, go through it very, very quickly. Maybe we won't do all of it, but just run through part of it. It is upon us, it is incumbent upon us to praise you, the master of all, to give greatness to he who created the world. He didn't make us like any other nations. He doesn't treat us like any other families of the world. We have a very different role in this world than other nations do. We bow before God. He did all these remarkable things in his creation of the world. Who elokeinu ein od? He is our God. There is no one else. There our, our God is true. There's nothing in comparison to him. Just going on to the next paragraph. And therefore, therefore what? We pray to you, God, that we should merit to see the, your glory speedily and eradicate idols from the world and clarify that you indeed are the one who runs the world. Let all the residents of the world recognize that to you all knees should bend. Let all the residents of the world give honor to your name and let it be that you rule upon all residents of the world speedily. As it says in the Pasuk, God will rule forever. It's a very powerful tefillah. And all of a sudden, we start quoting other Pesukim. So this, I probably should have begun with this. Each section, Malchios, Zichronos, and Shofros, cites 10 verses. 10 verses. Generally speaking, it's three verses from the Chumash, three verses from the scriptures, three verses from the prophets, and then we end off with one more verse from Chumash. There's actually a significance to the number 10. The Gemara has different reasons. It could be because there's a specific, one of the Halalukas talks about praising God with the shofar, and that has 10 verses of praise in the, in the chapter. It could be to parallel the 10, uh, the 10 declarations with which God created the world. It could be to parallel the 10 commandments. But in any event, we say that the number 10 is very significant. So now we start citing Psukim. And I guess what I would ask you to think about as we look very quickly at the Psukim, is what does it mean to say that God is our king? Because presumably, whatever we mean is the point we're bringing out from the Psukim. So if we were to pause and think about what point was made in the Aleinu, I think it's fair to say that we recognize that our world revolves around God, that our life has to revolve around God, and that we yearn for the day that God's kingdom over this world will become clear. That's what it seems that Elena kind of set the tone, that that's what it means to make God my king. Let's look a little bit at these psukim. It says that God does not see any iniquity in Jacob. God, Hashem, their Lord, is with them, and the, the blowing of the king is with them. Okay, so that's just that God is the king of the Jewish people. It will be, the next verse, it will be that when God looks upon, uh, th that when we connect with God, with the people join together to connect with God, uh, he is the king over us. Okay. Let's go on to the section of, of, of uh, scriptures. Another pasuk about the fact that God is the king. He reigns over the nations. Another pasuk that talks about in the end of days that the king of glory will come. Let's keep on going. Again, we're not, people can obviously take the time to look at it more, more in a detailed way for themselves. So says God, I am first and I am last. There's nothing other than me. Um, it'll be that clear at the end of days that to God is the kingdom. Uh, it will be that God will be king over all the land. It will be God is one and his name is one. And then the final pasuk over here, Shema Yisrael Hashem Okein Hashem Achad. It's interesting, for example, this final passage doesn't even refer to God as a king. It refers to God as Elokeinu, our Lord. So I guess the question is, what are we really saying here? What point are we trying to make in emphasizing that God is our king? If anything, it seems to be a statement about the future. That the vast majority of these circumcided seem to speak to that when the ultimate redemption occurs, it will be clear that God is the king. What does that have to do with me? I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it in mind when that day comes. But what does that have to do with me? Of course, we know that Rosh Hashanah, starting on Rosh Hashanah, we make a, a fundamental change in our davening. We start speaking about God in Shemona Esri, not as a Kel HaKadosh, but HaMelech HaKadosh. Not the God of, uh, not the, the Holy God, but the Holy King. 
So what real point are we making here? And I would like, if, if I may, I would like to break it down to what I think, just thinking about these psukim, I think it's three different points. One point is by saying that at the end of days, God's reign over this world will, will be clear, that we say not only will it be clear to the Jewish people, but we believe that the day will come where God's reign will be clear to everyone on this planet, we're making a very, very significant statement. And that statement is that we have a clarity of purpose. We have a clear goal. Our entire life is focused towards the ultimate redemption. And when that ultimate redemption occurs, it will be clear that God rules over the world, which means that life is full of setting goals and life is full of setting my short-term goals and my long-term goals. What we're saying as a long-term goal is that we believe that the most worthwhile investment of my energies every day I'm on this planet is following the will of God. Because I firmly believe that a day will come on this world where all of humanity recognizes God and God is absolutely running the world, which means it only makes sense to say that in my long-term vision, more than anything else, it has to be about how I'm serving God. It's a very simple idea, but I don't know how much we really focus on this idea in our day-to-day -day lives. And Rosh Hashanah, more than anything else, is about focusing on that very simple, yet very significant idea. This is what my life is about. So they are when I ask myself, am I succeeding in life? Am I moving closer to where I want to be in life? A core part of that reflection has to be, am I serving God in the way I want to serve him? Related to that is the Pasuk that we have a mitzvah from the Torah to say daily. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, which is the closing verse in, this, in, in the section of verses that we say to Israel that Hashem is our God and Hashem is one. Saying Hashem is our God is to say that our life has to revolve around him, not just down the road, but today. And saying God is one is a very powerful philosophical statement that we believe everything that happens in this world is from God. Everything, whether it be the things that I see as remarkable blessings, whether it be the things that I can't fathom, why a God would want me to experience these things, whether it be the things that I see as my success, all of these things we have to see as coming from God. So the more I think about that basic idea on every day of my life, but particularly on Rosh Hashanah, the more I'm quote unquote with the program. I wanna go back to one verse that we read pretty quickly before that's quoted by the Bali Musar quite frequently on in this season. Can you see where I put an arrow? Do you see my arrow? Yes, okay, so right by the arrow of Nemar. It says in the verse, Vayihivi Shurun Melech. It will be when there is a king over Jeshurun. Jeshurun is this phrase used to connote the general unity of the Jewish people. Bisasev Roshay Om as the heads of nation gather, Yachad Shivte Israel, together the tribes of Israel. Most of the psukim that we cited spoke about God's governance over us, God's kingship over us. Many of them spoke about the end of days. There's a very important piece in this puzzle. Bisasef Roshay Um, when the heads of nation come together. And on that, the Bali Musar say, Ain melech below am. You can't have a king without a nation, which means part of my looking at God as my king, the primary part of looking at God as my king is, is rededicating myself to his service. But a secondary part of looking at God as my king is recognizing that if he's my king, he's every other Jew's king as well. And the best way, one of the best ways for me to relate to him as my king is to be united and have a united cause with all the other members of the Jewish people, which means that my coordinating God as my king is not only about how I relate to God 
in mitzvahs between man and God, it's about how to relate to God in interpersonal instructions as, as well. That are we living as united people? If we unite, if we look out for each other, if we're interested in each other, if we care about each other, then we've created a united nation to serve God. And by caring about others, I'm increasing my honor and glorifying of God's name. So that's another important part of kingship to think about. I want to read together the closing paragraph of this bracha, and then we'll stop for comments. Our God, the God of our fathers, rule over all of the world in your glory. Elevate yourself over all of the world and inspire each and every person on this world. Let every person know that you created him. Let every creation know that you've created them. And let every human being on this world, Jewish or non-Jewish, that has a soul declare Hashem, the God of Israel, is the king. And he rules over everything in this world. So I recognize, God, that you run the world. And I sincerely wish and hope that every human being on this planet recognize it as well. And then sanctify, that was big picture, now smaller picture. Help me serve you. Sanctify us with your mitzvot. Give us your share in your Torah. Satiate us with your goodness. Make us joyful in your salvation. Purify our souls to serve you because you are true and your word is true. Now, many people will remember that this paragraph is something that shows up in the Yom Tadavni in general. So we've done a very interesting thing with this bracha. Baruch HaTo Hashem, you are the king over all of the land. You sanctify Israel and the day of remembrance, which is Rosh Hashanah. We've created a fusion in this bracha between a general bracha on the day of Rosh Hashanah, and that's why, for example, we had the Musaf offering in the bracha, and a statement that God is the king of the world. The brachos of Zichronos and Shofros are not generally about Rosh Hashanah. They're only about God's dominion over the world. And so what we're saying is that this mission of clarifying in our minds that existence on this world is about recognizing God as our king is core to the day of Rosh Hashanah more than either of the other two special components that we'll mention. So that takes us through the bracha of Malchios. I do want to see if there were any sheats that came in. There was one. Well, uh, I'm not sure. I'm just going to stop the share for a moment so I can see the chat. Um, what a great question. What a great question. Um, thank you. Just a technical question for a second. People should feel free to ask technical questions as well. Um, we have the practice of bowing during the Aleinu in the Chazan's repetition on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, of course, at the spot that we say, that we bow down. Um, I believe that the halacha is that we not bow down um, when we're davening in the, in the private Shemona Esrei, because there's a very much a prescribed list of places that we're supposed to bow in the private Shemona Esrei. Uh, we, bow down, we bow down in the Chazan's repetition, both on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, uh, but I would not do it in the private Shemona Esrei. Um, and I would say that even if we're in a place with a safer Torah. Yeah, thank you for raising that. that. That's my understanding, at least. Thank you for raising that. Any other questions? You can feel free to unmute yourself and call it out. Any other questions before we go on? Okay, so I'm going to go back to sharing the screen. Okay. Um, now, as we go on to Zechronos, I just want to mention the following. When I summarized the brachos at the beginning, I referred to Zichronos as referring, as relating to God as a judge. Now, does Zohar really mean that God is a judge? Zohar really means that God remembers. Isn't that just a small detail in the big picture? We recognize God as judging us on this very special day. Now, Part of how he judges us is because he has, remembers everything that's ever occurred in this world. Okay, so he is uniquely positioned to judge us. That's really, really impressive. And that's very intimidating. Is that the point? Is the point that God remembers everything or is the point that God is judging us based on his memory of everything? So it's interesting that we emphasize him as being he who remembers. The other thing that I think it's worthwhile to think about is what we mentioned before, which is that the Gemara says that through 
that through saying deception, God will remember us positively. Why should that be? Let's go through the section together here. You remember all the actions of this world, and you remember all the creations of this world. Everything hidden is revealed to you. Nothing is forgotten before you. Nothing is hidden from your eyes. You remember everything, and nothing can be hidden from you. Um, you see all generations. You're not limited by time. You see the entire past, and you see the entire future. This is the beginning of your days. This commemorates back to the first day of the world. And on this day, countries will be judged. Which countries will be judged by the sword? Which one countries will have peace? Who will have famine? Will have satiation? People will be remembered on this day. There are people who will be judged on this day for life. The people who judged on this day for death. Nobody escapes this day. Ashrei Yishloish Kacheka, fortune is the person who doesn't forget you. Because people who seek you out will always succeed because they'll remember you. So God, you remember everything. Okay, pretty intimidating. And you remembered Noah with love. Why in the world are we going to Noah? What is it about Noah? And you judged him with salvation and mercy. When you, bought, when you brought the waters of the flood to destroy mankind. And therefore, his memory comes before you to increase the inhabitants of the world in a great way. And now we go back into citing Psukim. We cite the Pasuk that God remembered Noah and he decided that the waters of the flood subside. Now let's cite the next Pasuk of remembering. God remembered their cries. This is from the Jewish experience in Egypt that God, God heard, sorry, God heard their cries and God remembered his covenant with Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Then we have the Pasuk, God says, I remember my covenant with the forefathers, um, which, which speaks of the fact that God's promise to ultimately bring blessing to the Jewish people. You have some other Pasuk, you have some other Pasukim that uh, talk about that, uh, the way God acts and God always remembers his covenant. And now we go on to Navi, that God says, so say to the Jewish people, I remember the kindness of your youth, the fact that you followed me in the desert. God talks about remembering his covenant with the Jewish people. God talks about remembering the Jews in, in a very favorable and compassionate way. So why would it be that the emphasis is on remembering and why would it be that the specific psukim that we talk about by remembering jump back to Noah and the experience of the Jews in Egypt? And why is all of this such a merit that if we say this section, God will look upon us favorably? And I think that the basic idea here is a very significant idea. And this is said in different ways by a number, by number of different uh, by a number by a number of different commentators, which is as follows. So uh, it's already been mentioned. I have a child who's celebrating a birthday today. So as a parent, looking at a child celebrating a birthday, it's a very natural emotion to look back over the years and 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 think about how that child has developed over the years. It's a very natural thing. What zechira, what remembering really does is remembering links different points in time. Remembering links the past to the present and through linking the past to the present, one can look forward to a future. The more I can see, I can judge a person standing in front of me. If my child, and this is not intended for the child to celebrate his birthday specifically. If a child acts in an inappropriate manner, I, as a parent, have the responsibility to assess the child's action and decide, should I punish the child? Should I not punish the child? Should I speak to the child? Should I not speak to the child? That's judgment. That's if I'm frozen in time. But if I look at a child and I say to myself, you know, this specific thing is a unique challenge for my child. Or, 
this specific area is an area that my child has gradually been progressing and improving in. Or, gosh, this is an area that my child has been backsliding in for a while now. Whatever my impression of the past, using that to inform the present will fundamentally alter the manner in which I interact with the child. If I find this child has a difficulty with this area, I am going to be more compassionate towards the child. If I find the child is backsliding in this area, I have to react differently. If I find the child is improving in this area, I'll act differently yet. And that impacts how I look at the child right now. But part of how that impacts how I look at the child right now is my hopes for the child's future. I don't see this child frozen in time. I see this child with a potential moving forward. So God looked at the world in the middle of a flood. And Noah and his family and a collection of animals are on this ark. Do they deserve for the world to start over for them? I don't know. I mean, they've been on the ark. There's a lot said that Noah conducted himself with kindness towards the creatures on the ark. Very nice. Is, is, is that kindness grounds for everything that will happen moving forward? Recreating the world? Who knows? God didn't just look at Noah on the ark. God looked at Noah back when the world around him was utterly immoral. God saw the greatness of Noah and how he conducted himself in that sense, in that context. And God said, this is a person worthy of starting the world over. So God didn't stop the flood because of how Noah was in this moment. God stopped the flood because of how he remembered Noah, what Noah had done, and God's aspirations for Noah in the future. Why did God save the Jewish people from Egypt? God didn't save the Jewish people from Egypt because we were doing great things in that moment. We were on practically the lowest level of, sp of spiritual impurity. God looked at the Jewish people and God saw them as extensions of the patriarchs and matriarchs, those, those people with whom he cultivated a covenant. And why did he cultivate that covenant? He cultivated that covenant because he believed that these people would foster future generations that would bring great things to the world. The pasuk that God says that I'll always remember my covenant with you and I'll remember you and I'll bring you to the land. Also, I see your past, your, your extreme past in terms of the patriarchs, but I made a decision at that point that there'd always be greatness within you. And because of that greatness within you, I would bring you great blessing moving forward. So I remember in the present, my decision of the past to look toward your future. None of this is judgment in the moment. All of this is zahira, is remembering. And when you think about it, zahira is not only God being above time, but it's also God having the capacity and the will to look at each and every one of us with remarkable depth. And to see, and that's of course what he did when he looked at the Jewish people in Egypt, that's, of course, what he did when he looked at Noah and his family and decided to start the world over. So what we're saying to God is we say to him, God, we recognize, we recognize that you don't look at us as one-dimensional. And we see it from the Chumash. And we see it from Sukkim elsewhere as well. We recognize God that you look at our total capacity as people. And by the way, we recognize that you see us as being the descendants of Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, which means that you see us as having remarkable potential. I'm, I'm reminded of a beautiful, beautiful essay from Rav Leo Dessler. I'm sure I've shared this with a number of you in the past. He asks, what does it really mean that we talk about the merit of the previous generations, the merit of the forefathers? Because there's actually a Gemara that says the merit of the forefathers has run out. So what do we even think we're accomplishing? 
So again, it is, it's a beautiful piece. I'm not going to do it justice in a few minutes. But the basic gist is he suggests that we believe that the patriarchs, the matriarchs imbued different remarkable character traits in the, in the fabric, in the spiritual fabric of the Jewish people for all generations. And that what we say when we talk about remarkable things that have happened from past generations, from the patriarchs, from the matriarchs, is we believe we have that ability within us, God. So we understand that we might not have conducted ourselves as well the past year as we would like, but we also understand that we have remarkable potential. And we ask you to view that potential when you're looking at us. Remember, remember our depth of personality, remember from whom we come. And that's what we're asking God when we ask for Zechira. And I think we can understand the Gemara. I saw once from the Sefer Soraya Das this point. I think we can understand the Gemara. When the Gemara says, if we speak about God being the one who remembers, that will cause him to remember us well. The idea really is, if we speak about God as having this remarkable depth of perspective towards us, the more we talk about that, the more we recognize, my gosh, I have to look at myself in a certain way. I have to believe a certain potential that I have. And if God sees me thinking that way and feeling that way, then I can become a different person. Then I can use Rosh Hashanah as a springboard to daven differently, to interact with people differently, to do mitzvahs differently, because I believe I have it within me. Oh, if I'm thinking and feeling that way, then of course God will look at me differently because I'm ready to pivot in a different direction. Let's read the closing paragraph of the bracha. The God and the gods of our, and the God of our fathers. Think about that in light of what we said. Remember us in a positive way before you. See our goodness. Ultimately bring us salvation and mercy from your heights. Remember the covenant that you made to Avram and his children on the mountain of Akedas Yitzchak. Akedas Yitzchak is the ultimate moment of someone showing their utter devotion to the service of God. Remember the promise you made to him and see us as descendants of Avraham. Remember that Avram pushed aside his personal compassion for Yitzchak to do your will. So too, God, um, so too, you should look with us towards mercy. You should look with us to do that, that um, excuse me, you should, you should push aside your anger to look upon us with mercy and fulfill for us that which you have assured us in your Torah, that I'll remember for you the covenant of the first generations, that I took them out of Egypt to be for them a God. I am Hashem. You looked at them positively, the people from Egypt, looked at them positively because you saw their connection with the patriarchs and the matriarchs, and you saw their personal potential. Look at us positively as well. You remember everything that is forgotten. You are eternal, and nothing is forgotten before you. And please, if there's one specific thing on a global scale that you remember, remember Akedas Yitzchak. Avram and Yitzchak together proved they were able to put all personal inclination aside for the sake of doing your will. We have that within us as well. Please interact with us in that way. So blessed are you, Hashem, who remembers the covenant with our nation. And please act on that covenant. I'll just hold for a moment if anyone has any, whether in the chat or to share uh, on mute, any comments you'd like to share, questions. Okay. So now we'll go back. Sorry. Now we'll go back to the Shofro section. And now to think about why it's so important to talk about the fact that we blow the shofar. I mean, we blow it, we don't blow it. God knows why we blow the shofar. Why are we emphasizing it? And by the way, emphasizing it even on a day that we're not even going to blow the shofar. Shabbos, Rosh Hashanah, we won't blow the shofar. You revealed yourself in your holy cloud on your sacred nation to speak to them. 
you shared with them your voice from the cloud. This is, of course, referring to the scene at Har Sinai, and now where, where God revealed himself from the cloud for the giving of the Torah. And part of the aspect at Har Sinai is ko shofar chazak ma'ot, that there was a very strong shofar blast, and everyone trembled at Har Sinai. There's another passage that talks about the shofar blowing at Har Sinai, and it talks about the people seeing the shofar. So there's a lot of Har Sinai reference. What in the world that has to do with us, we'll have to understand. Then there are different psukim from scriptures talk about praising God with the shofar. One of the ideas of shofar Rosh Hashanah is the blowing of the shofar was seen as a coronation of the king. So therefore, in praise of God, we blow the shofar. And finally, we have a pasuk that talks to all the residents of the world that when the shofar is blown, you will hear it. And on that day, the shofar will be blown and those who are lost in the land of Asher will come back and they'll bow down to God. And God will appear to them and the shofar will be blown. These three psukim are all references to the ultimate redemption of the Jewish people. So three different points. We have reference to the shofar blowing at Har Sinai. We have reference to just the general revelation of God as, as master of the universe in the end of days. We have reference to the shofar blowing at the redemption of the Jewish people and the coming of the Mashiach. What is any of this? So we connect, we connect it to coronating of God as a king. But what does the rest of it have to do with blowing a shofar on Rosh Hashanah? There are many different ideas said about this. Uh, what I frequently like to quote is the Maral's idea. And the Maral's idea is that there's a remarkable thing in the idea of a wind instrument that what a wind instrument does is the wind instrument takes the breath within me and I bring out the breath within me and I send it through that instrument and all of a sudden there's this sound that comes out. And what the shofar represents is bringing hidden potential out into the reality of the world. That's the idea of the morale for the greatness of shofar. That's very relevant when you think about the giving of the Torah, we say that when God created the world, he looked at the Torah and based on that Torah, he created the world. Which means that from the day of the creation of the world until the giving of the Torah, there was all of this purpose and meaning floating around that was not at all apparent to the world's inhabitants, not clear in the slightest. And yet it was for them to see and for them to understand and that was a very challenging thing. And now all of a sudden, it all is brought out. Obviously the Jewish people as God's chosen people and the recipients of the Torah receive the Torah in a whole different way, in a whole different level. But we believe all of us, all of the inhabitants of the world relate to the world in a different way, relate to God in a different way through his sharing the Torah with the world, taking something that was very much in the fabric of the world, but hidden, and bringing it out, revealing it. The ultimate redemption of the world. Every moment in this world is a step towards the ultimate redemption. We are believing Jews. We're taught this. So hopefully we internalize it on some level. We could probably uh, gain a lot in terms of how we internalize that. And certainly other people in this world who don't even know our traditions have no idea that we believe we're moving towards an ultimate redemption. And one day, it's just going to come out of nowhere the shofar will be blown and no one will have seen it coming. And that's this potential within us that's just going to come rushing out. And that says the morale is the symbolism of the shofar. What does that have to do with Rosh Hashanah? So you could say different things, but I think the most basic way to look at it, once we've sort of pulled down this idea, is that just think to yourself, if you were trying to inspire somebody about Rosh Hashanah, someone who felt they were in a funk for one reason or another, and they said, I just don't know why I'm even, why I'm even doing Rosh Hashanah this year. What difference does it all make? I don't know about any of you. If I was speaking to such a person, my biggest goal would be to try to get the person to see that they can do better. That if this person would really believe fundamentally that they could do better, that they have greatness within them, they would look at themselves in a whole different way. 
they'd look at their relationship with God in a whole different way. And they'd certainly see Rosh Hashanah as a remarkable opportunity. So that being the case, that being the case and that being the idea, we could view Rosh Hashanah as an opportunity. Excuse me. We could view Rosh Hashanah as an opportunity that that which is buried deep, deep within us, that which is buried deep within us, to let it come out, to let it push its way out in a remarkable way to look at Rosh Hashanah in that light, to view Rosh Hashanah in that light. So we say to God, I believe there's a lot within me. I share it with you, God. I want you to see that which is within me. By the way, the fact that the, the Rosh Hashanah shofar is just a sound and it's not specific words, it's just a sound. How many times do we express our emotion? Maybe not in as sophisticated a way as words can, but in such a real way when just the sound comes out, whether it be a crying, whether it be laughing, whether it be a sigh, a groan, all these sounds. God, hear the sound within us. The chauffeur's supposed to sound like crying. Hear how much we desperately would like to connect in a more meaningful way to you. Hear that from us, God. On the other hand, we need to hear it ourselves. We need to see the words of the shofar, the sound of the shofar, but the words also referring to the shofar and say, you know what? There is a purpose to this bit of shofar. There is something deep within me. I want God to see what's deep within me, but I need myself to see what's deep within me because if I see what's deep within me, then I can connect to that potential. Therefore, it's powerful to, to talk about shofar on Rosh Hashanah, even if I'm not blowing shofar to remember that image and to remember how much God believes things are hidden within this world, whether it be that he brought it out of Har Sinai, whether he brings it out of the ultimate revelation. And just to come back to the Gemara that we started with, talk about Zichronos, talk about God as a rememberer so that he'll remember us positively. And what will be the instrument with which he'll remember us positively? Bashofar. Shofar, we spoke about the idea of, rem- of looking at God as one who remembers as being very much about believing that God can see what's inside of us and God recognizes what's inside of us. So now I'm going to blow the shofar. Right after I've said that section, I now talk about shofar. I'm going to blow the shofar. I blew the shofar earlier on Rosh Hashanah. And that is that by my blowing the shofar and myself hearing the sound of the shofar, I recognize that I believe I can be different. The shofar is a reminder to God that we can be different. It's a reminder to ourselves that we can be different. Let's just read this last section. Excuse me. Our God, the God of our fathers, blow the great shofar. This is the ultimate way for God to bring out the hidden, the shofar of the redemption for our freedom and raise the banner to gather us together and bring us together from all different places. Bring us to a redeemed Jerusalem and in that place, we'll do our offerings before you. As we cite the passage that talks about that on the days of our celebrations, we'll blow the trumpets uh, before Hashem, our God. Because you, God, hear the shofar and listen to its sounds. And no one is like you. No one can truly understand what's inside of us, what you're waiting to do with the world like you can. Blessed be Hashem. You hear the voice of the blow of the Jewish people with compassion. So this is Malchios, Sichronos, and Shofros. Again, just to sum up, each one has its ten psukim, but just to sort of give at least a positive, a possible angle on each one. Malchios is more global. We recognize the fact that God is the master of the world. It's incumbent upon all of us to bring that understanding of what our lives are about in, much, in a much more dramatic way into our lives and to rededicate ourselves to his service. We talk about Zichronos, which is recognizing that God is this ultimate judge and his being an ultimate judge recognizes that he remembers, he remembers our national past and future, 
our personal past and future, and he truly has a sense of our depth of character, personality, and wants to view us in that light. And the more I think about his wanting to view us in that light, the more I hopefully have inspired to see my own positive aspects. And then we have Shofros that speaks about the fact that we understand this mitzvah of the day is to bring that which is hidden inside of us out to the open to remind God how much we want to serve him and remind ourselves how much we want to serve him. And that we pray that the same way that God brought an ultimate revelation to the world at the giving of the Torah at our Sinai, so too we pray that he brings an ultimate revelation speedily at the ultimate redemption. Okay, um, let me just take some comments here. Um, I just want to share, I'm not sure if, I, if the person was saying it for quotation or not, but uh, someone with a connection to the Sephardi world as well uh, wrote to me, there's a beautiful P.O. to Sephardim say called Okeid Vanakad that really brings it home to us that in Rosh Hashanah, we are all on our personal Akeda. So it's not just about remembering the merits from Avram and Yitzchak at the offering of Yitzchak on the altar, but also making it more relevant to us so many years later, which certainly fits into what we discussed. Thank you so much. Um, someone did ask if there's a way to access this recording. So God willing, um, I have been recording this, so God willing, we'll put it up on YouTube later, and then we'll share the link, and then we'll send out a cyber brief uh, as a link. Um, I see another comment came in. It's internally conflicting to approach God, believing we would potentially be better. Yeah, yeah, fair. So how do you reconcile these hopefully uplifting ideas, you know, that we have the potential to be better with the extreme self-criticism of Yom Kippur? You know, Yom Kippur is we really let ourselves have it. God, we send them this way, 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 this way. So uh, two thoughts. Uh, it's a very valid point. One thought is it's very interesting that Rosh Hashanah would really just focus on this first point, that philosophically we have to, we take this day as not a day of beating up on ourselves, uh, but a day of just focusing on our inherent goodness, which again, if you think of Malchios, Sechronos, and Shofros as sort of the core of what Rosh Hashanah is, of how we're supposed to relate to Rosh Hashanah, really two thirds of it we said are really touching on our inherent goodness. You know, and, and one third wasn't beating up on ourselves just as much as sort of reminding ourselves of a responsibility, basically. Uh, so that's interesting. I think actually the two points um, go hand in hand better than we would naturally think. I think so, because I think the way, to, the way to look at it is as follows. I think the way to view it is that we believe that, um, we first have to believe in ourselves. If we don't believe that we have any great potential it's actually, there's a, there's a famous, famous Musaf word told on uh, yesterday's uh, Parsha. I'm sure a number of you have heard this from me a number of times. But we'll just go for it again. Medrash says that at the beginning of the Parsha, it says in the beginning of the Parsha, Moshe says to Jewish people, you're all standing here before Hashem, your God. Rashi cites the Medrash that uh, the previous Parsha ended off with the Tochacha, the harsh words of rebuke. So the Jewish people heard the words of the Tochacha and they were terrified. So Moshe says, wow, you know, they're really scared. So he says, you know what? Don't worry too much. For all the harsh words that I said to you, you're still all here. So obviously you're not that bad off. You're okay. So the obvious question on the menu is just, why would you say that? Didn't you want to scare them? Didn't you want to put the fear of God in them? You did. So now you say, oh, but don't worry, everybody. Why would you do that? So the Bali Musa explained that, yes, Moshe wanted to intimidate them. But if the intimidation is so strong that the person says it's hopeless, then it's not going to accomplish the goal anyway. If a person says, you know what, I really am pathetic, I really, I really can't accomplish, then, they, then that becomes the greatest of self-fulfilling prophecies. So the goal of Rosh Hashanah is to believe in myself and to tell myself, I'm saying it to God, but hopefully I'm listening in, which is, of course, the purpose of much of prayer in general. The goal of Rosh Hashanah is to remind myself that I have so much goodness within me. I have so much goodness within me. I just have to get there. I just have to find it. Now, uh, if I've been thinking about it that way for the last week and some change, then I get to Yom Kippur and you know what? I am going to be better. A and, I, and I'm already being better. And so now I just have to cut the terms. Part of my being better is being honest with where I, where I haven't been good. But first, let's focus on how I can be better. First, let's focus on building up my own, self, my own spiritual self-esteem. 
once I do that, then it is appropriate for me to apologize for different things. Because that's the most, because that actually allows me to detach myself from it. In other words, ignoring what I've done is not bringing closure to it. Believing in myself and then doing tshuva for what I've done is to now really make myself a new person. So I think that's the way to look at it. It's a very valid point. Thank you for raising it. Any other comments? Okay. Stuart, I don't know if you have any closing remarks or not. Or Just that was really beautiful. I enjoyed that a lot. Thank hey, you. Thank you, thank you for, for putting it all together, Stuart. Thank Much you all for joining us today. Thank you. We should all have a ksiv v'chasimatova. Thank you, everybody, for joining. And um, obviously, we'll, we'll, we'll celebrate and mark this Rosh Hashanah in a very different way for so many of us. <laughs> for all of us, in one way or another, it's going to be different. But we should just, I think these kind of Zooms are very uniting, unifying so many people on it. It's inspiring to see so many people. And we should consider ourselves united of the spirit, if not necessarily physically united, at the same room, the same building, the same minion, etc. cetera. Uh, so we should all have a ksiv v'chasim atova. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Rabbi. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Have Thank a you. Tova and a safe one. Amen for you too. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Have a wonderful Thank you, year. Rabbi. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Gotcha. Thank you, Rabbi. Take care, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>